Hello, First Church family and friends, and welcome to this time of worship and our ongoing celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Before we begin singing our opening hymn, which is Thine Be the Glory, we're going to have a little Faith Promise update. Faith Promise is our shared mission outreach. We take our pooled resources and we support mission and ministries that are both in our backyard as well as on the other side of the world. So today's Faith Promise update is literally about a mission in our own backyard. Let's listen. The First Church Preschool. It's an award-winning, Christian-based early education program. Has loving and fun teachers, and such strong dedication in its director and board and teachers that throughout this whole year of COVID, in-person classes have been able to be held. And we celebrate that next year, there's already a full registration in order to make this incredible ministry open to as many as possible. Scholarships are available for families that need some financial help. Your gifts to Faith Promise make that happen. Thank you for making a difference in a little one's life. God bless you.
in our hearts again increase in us we pray unveil why we're made come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls holy spirit come and made us now First Church. Our first reading of today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 36 through 48. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see, a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? 
They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, friends, if you would please bow and pray with me this morning. Merciful, holy, and faithful Lord Jesus Christ, you died for our sins and were raised for our justification. In view of your resurrection, we ask that you would awaken us also from the grave of our sins and iniquities and grant us your grace, that we may partake in your eternal life at the final resurrection of all the dead. Christ is risen indeed, the first of the sleepers. Glory and power are his forever and ever. And now friends, join me in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, we're rolling. All right, thank you. Come July 1st, I will be celebrating my 27th year in ministry. And I figure that I have preached well over 1,200 sermons by now, over the years. And over the course of all of those years and all of those sermons and all of those weeks, the week, the week in and the week out preparation for Sunday morning, I've got to admit that there are weeks when the preaching tasks can be very hard, like pulling teeth, as the old saying goes. This has been one of those weeks for me. When the words are hard to find, when the idea is hard to hone in on, uh, the sermon seems that it's something that's not always going to be memorable for everyone, no doubt that's true. It's sometimes a struggle to be relevant. My preaching professor, uh, Reverend Dr. William McLean, from Wesley Seminary, he recently passed and he must have taught and trained hundreds of preachers over the years, he taught us very clearly that the preaching task is to bring the Word of God to bear upon the people of God. And I've never forgotten that over the years. And he said, so therefore you need to know the Word of God, and you need to know who are the people in front of you, and, and how that Word um, is, is relevant to their lives. And sometimes... Sometimes that's a struggle to figure that out. And sometimes that preaching task is a struggle to not sound repetitive. I had a colleague in Virginia one time that told me that he'd gotten to this point in ministry where he says, all I can figure out to preach each week is to love one another. And he'd been a minister for, for quite some time, and, and I'm not quite sure he was grieved because he wasn't feeling creative, or if he was grieved because he felt like he needed to keep saying the same message. I'm not sure. I wish I had listened a little bit longer for him. But I wonder if Peter... Peter, he was early in his preaching ministry, no doubt, um, but I wonder if he experienced a bit of this struggle that my uh, colleague in Virginia expressed because of what he says on the heels of the story we shared last week. 
Last week we had the story of the man who was born lame and Peter and John walked past him and he was asking for money and Peter and John said, we don't have uh, silver or gold to give you, but what we do have, we do give you. And, and he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, walk. And, and the man was healed and he got up and walked and he rejoiced and he jumped around and, and people saw him and, and they were absolutely amazed. Different passage or different translations say either they were amazed or they were astonished by what they had witnessed. And it was after that that Peter then addressed the crowd. After they had witnessed what had taken place with this man, then Peter addressed the crowd. He addressed their astonishment, if you will. So let's listen. Acts chapter 3, verses 12 through 19. Hear this word of the Lord. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, then, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So Peter says, fellow Israelites. Now most likely, these are the same people he's already talked to. He's already preached a sermon to them. In the previous chapter, Acts chapter 2, Peter has addressed, he has said the same things. Fellow Israelites. What had happened in that story is that the Holy Spirit was given to the believers, to the disciples, and they started speaking about the gospel of Jesus in other languages. And when people heard it, the scripture says that they were astonished and amazed. And in their astonishment or amazement, Peter addressed them there. He says, fellow Israelites, why are you astonished? And, and he begins to tell them once again the Jesus story. To a large degree, he says now the same message once again to the same people. Telling about Jesus, about how God had worked through Jesus, how Jesus had fulfilled the prophets, and how he was handed over to the elders, how he had been crucified, how he died, and how he was raised. And then the proclamation that this Jesus is still at work in the world today. In both stories, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, we see the same pattern. There is something amazing that happens that people witness. They respond with astonishment and amazement. And then there is the explanation of what has happened and the proclamation of Jesus. The same pattern. It feels a little repetitive. And I wonder if Peter sighed like my colleague in Virginia did that one time. I wonder if he sighed as he looked out over the crowd and thought, I just explained this to you last week. Um, I, I wonder if Peter felt like he was being repetitive. Honestly, I've gotten beyond that in my 27 years of being a pastor. 
because repetitive, being repetitive, is part of the nature of doing ministry. My husband and I would sit sometimes on a weekend as I was working through some things uh, for a sermon, and I would be reflecting with him, this is what I think I'm going to say, and, and whatnot, and I'll, I would say to him, but it feels like I just said that. And Jeffrey always, every time I would say that, he would say, but Lisa, someone still needs to hear that. Or, there's nothing wrong with repeating a very good message. But being repetitive is the nature of doing ministry. It really is. And it would be very good for us to remember that as we go year by year in ministry. Whatever the ministry is. I do the ministry of, of preaching along with others, of course. Um, but we all do different ministries. The ministry of visiting the, the sick. The ministry of, of handing out food. The ministry of, of hanging out with the youth, the ministry of teaching the children. Year by year, it seems to be the same work, the ministry of Santa's Wonderland, the ministry of, of the Easter celebration, the Christmas celebration, the concerts. Year by year, we seem to repeat the ministries, but this is not a bad thing. This is something that we need to do because this is the nature of ministry, to continue speaking the same gospel message into every season of life. The reality is we need to keep showing up to do this even if it does seem repetitive each week and each month. And we do this not with the expectation of a once and done mindset. That's the thing. We can't ever approach ministry with a once and done mindset. Sometimes I have experienced that in a church, perhaps I have an idea or someone else has an idea, a creative idea on how to do ministry. And sometimes people will say, we tried that one time as if, well, we tried it once and it didn't work. So therefore, it, we, we shouldn't ever address that ever again. Um, I came to the realization that that might be a little futile of approach to ministry because I know that there are many, many things in life that we don't give up on with just one try. Driving a car, potty training a child, whatever it is, it takes some time to get the job done. And so we cannot approach ministry with a once and done attitude. And we cannot approach ministry with the expectation that we will get the kingdom fully served. Because that is not going to be able to take place. No one person in one period of time is going to be able to accomplish everything that Jesus needs done in this world, serving the church. We need all kinds of churches in all kinds of places throughout every single year of existence in order to keep having the kingdom be served in this world. Archbishop Oscar Romero, um, he it was a martyred uh, bishop in El Salvador. And he, he spoke to this one time, and I want, to share, I want to share this reflection because it does help us to have the right kind of mindset to give us energy to keep doing ministry year after year. It's the energy that Peter was going to need as he began his ministry of continuing to do something year after year. And so I want to share with you these words. And if you want to read them aloud with me, feel free. It helps now and then to step back and take a long view. The kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, it is even beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete which is a way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us. No statement says all that could be said. No prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection. 
No pastoral visit brings wholeness. No program accomplishes the church's mission. No set of goals and objectives includes everything. This is what we are about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces effects far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything, and there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something, and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders, ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future that is not our own. And so we keep on and keep on and keep on doing the ministry. We repeat the messages when we need to. We do the same work year in and year out as we need to. We continue being faithful to the message even when we don't see a big change in the world. Even when we see that that the world is still in darkness, but we keep on this ministry of Jesus speaking life into the echoes of death, and we keep speaking light into the darkness, because this is the work of Christ. No doubt, Peter was going to need to speak that same message again and again and again. So let us not lose heart these 2,000 years later, continuing to do the gospel. Let us not fall away from this. Let us keep fast to sharing this word, holding fast to the gospel, and not give up. And why? Why not give up? Why not move on to something easier? Well... Simply put, because God hasn't given up on us. A few years after Peter wrote or spoke of that sermon in Acts chapter 3, he wrote a letter. We call that Second Peter. And in the third chapter of that, in verse 9, he wrote something that needs to be a motto, perhaps, for us that we don't give up because God doesn't give up. We continue to be patient doing the work of ministry because God continues to be patient. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, God is not slow as some people think of as slow, but God is patient, wanting everyone to come to repentance. And so God keeps doing the same work, keep speaking the same message into the darkness and into death, the messages of life and light. So let me close by perhaps sounding repetitive, but hoping that it finds a place in the broken places of your heart. God loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus rose for your sake. And God always is waiting for us to return. Amen.
was justice to rescue and free us, but still we demanded his death. Our sin laid upon him, we cursed and sped on him, he hung as his mercy was shed. But he cried, it is finished. time of worship, a couple of announcements. First of all, our Chapel in the Woods worship services are going to begin a couple of weeks early this year. In order to accommodate more people for in-person worship, we're going to begin our outdoor worship services again on May 16th 
at 8 a.m. You can make a reservation like you do for uh, sanctuary worship services. Uh, you can find all those details out on our website or in your e-news. And secondly, we want to celebrate our graduates here coming up in a few weeks. If you have a graduate, know a graduate, or you are a graduate, please send us your information, who you are, what you're graduating from, where you're headed next, and we will be able to celebrate you coming up here. And so let us now remember the basic statements of our faith, that Christ has died, Christ is risen and Christ will come again. Let these faith statements guide your days ahead. Let them inform how you live your life. So go in faith, hope, and love in the name of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. See you next week. 